I'm going to continue today to talk to you about the blood. And then uh, probably two more weeks that I'm going to be sharing about the blood. Now, now the reason is this, because there is nothing that is more foundational or that is more important for you and me than the blood. Uh, In fact, the Bible actually tells us that it is through faith in his blood that he is our sacrifice. Without faith in the blood, there really is no salvation. But I want to take an, an, an additional week, and I want to talk to you about how to plead the blood or how to apply the blood. Right? Now, the Bible tells us in Revelation that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. That's what he does. He comes and accuses you. But the Bible tells us that Jesus is our advocate or our lawyer. Right? And, and how, what, do we, what do we plead? How, what do we say when the devil brings up your past? Uh, you can say not guilty. I, and that's kind of true, but I just, I'd plead the blood. Because the blood bade for my past. We're, we're going to talk very practically about how the blood of Jesus is to be used in the believer's life. All right, so I'm, I'm really wanting to encourage you not to miss. First uh, Peter chapter 1, verse 18 says that you were not redeemed or back, brought, bought back from the fallen position that we fell into through Adam's sin. You weren't bought back or redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold. Now, you could not be redeemed from anything from this world. Because part of you is not from this world. Part of you is God-breathed. Part of you is from the eternal God realm. You see, your physical body will die, but the real you is just going to step out. And because of that, you could not be redeemed with something that was corruptible. You had to be redeemed from something from the eternal God realm. That's why you had to be redeemed, the Bible says, with the precious blood of Christ. You were, you were redeemed. I love that Colossians 1.13 says, From the domain of darkness, from the darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom, from the grip of the power of darkness, you have been purchased. In fact, Acts 20 verse 28 says, The church of God which he purchased with his own blood. In other words, God purchased you with the blood of God. That's how you were purchased with his own precious blood. And the power of the blood is in the worth of the life. And it was God's blood. Jesus' blood had the the divine power and life dwelling and working in it, and it is unceasing power. Romans 3.25 says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. So he is your propitiation or your sacrifice or your mercy seat through faith in his blood. Now, you cannot have faith in what you do not know because faith is dependent on knowledge. So that's why we're talking about the blood. But today I want to go to Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Revelation. Uh, A lot of people see that book and they think, ooh, all that end time scary stuff. But if you look, even the first verse says, the revelation, it's not revelations, it's just one revelation, and it's of Jesus Christ. It is not, so to speak, a book of revelations of end times, although there's some end time stuff in there. This is a revelation about Jesus, about who he is and about what he's done and what he's going to do. Revelation 1, verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins with his own blood and has made us to be kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Notice it says he loved us. And we can see the the, the absolute size of that love 
in the fact that he came and purchased you with his life blood. But with that blood, he washed us from our sins and made us kings and priests to God the Father. When the Israelites were in Egypt and God is bringing them out of Egypt, he said to Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me. Now, the purpose for their coming out of Egypt was to serve God. And this is what he said. He said, now, I'm going to have a whole nation of priests. Every one of you are going to be priests. And you're going to come out, and you are going to serve me. That was God's plan. And they, 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 they got to the mountain, and Moses went up to receive the Ten Commandments, and they make the golden calf. Well, Moses is up on their, the mountain, and they begin to uh, have a, a wild party down, on the, down at the base of the mountain. And Moses comes down, and you know the story. Before he even gave the children of Israel the commandments, he broke them all, they, because they broke them all. And Moses prays and intercedes for the people. And God said this. He says, uh, I, I'm not going to have all you guys priests anymore. He said, the, the one tribe that, that stood with me were the Levites. And so only the Levites are going to be priests. But that was never God's plan. His plan was to have a nation of priests. Now, in the New Testament, it tells us that Jesus has made you to be a priest. In fact, I would like you to turn to somebody and just say, I'm a priest. Because you are, because Jesus made you one with his blood. He made you a priest. Right? It says you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You are a royal priesthood. Now, this isn't talking about when you get to heaven. It's talking about here today. Not the sweet by and by, but the nasty here and now. Right? You, you, you are a priest right now. Right? And you have, but whether you realize it or not, you actually have priestly duties because he has made you a priest to God the Father. And you represent him. And as a priest, you are anointed and you are called. Right? Now, he called not just a few believers. He called every believer. Deuteronomy 10.8 says this. And at that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord and to stand before the Lord to minister to him and to bless in his name to this day. Now, the original plan was everybody. But how many of you know we're back to the original plan? The original plan is that every believer is a priest. Every believer is a minister. Now, what the priest did in the Old Testament, now, now let me just say this, they call it the, the, the Levitical or the Aaronic priesthood, right? And it says in Hebrews, with the change of the law, there is of necessity a change of priesthood. Right? So that priesthood is gone. It is gone. And there is a new priesthood. And, and we'll probably talk a little bit about that in, 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 a, in a few moments. Right? But what that priesthood did was they offered sacrifices so that there was forgiveness to the people, for the people. They also would worship. In fact, when David built his tabernacle, now you said, no, Mo, Solomon built the tabernacle. Now you read it. The Bible says that David built one, right? But it was just a tent. Solomon built a really ornate tabernacle, but David did not. But David built one. And this is what God said both in the Old Testament and is mentioned again in the New Testament. God said that I will restore the tabernacle of David. Right? Now, all the other tabernacles or temples had three sections there was one section where the ark was, where God's presence was, and the priest could go in once a year, never without blood, never without blood, or he'd drop dead. Right? But David put up a tent, put the ark in it, and it was just one room. And anybody could go in. 
Anybody could go into his presence. Right? But the Bible says that David had the, 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 the priests worshiping God. He had them worshiping God. He had different groups worshiping God 24-7. All that they were doing there, they were just lifting up their hands in the tabernacle. They're singing. They're worshiping. They're praising God 24-7. And by the way, that is the tabernacle that God said he's going to rebuild. Not the ornate ones, not the opulent ones, not the ones that with all the walls covered with gold. How many know God's not impressed with our gold? He can make streets out of it, right? But he was impressed with the worship. And, and it was the priests that went into that tabernacle and 24 hours a day they were worshiping. Anyone was welcome, but they were there 24 hours a day. And then it also, it mentioned, and to bless in his name. To bless in his name. He washed us from our sins with his own blood and made us kings and priests to God the Father. Now, as a priest, listen, you are, literally the Bible tells us, New Testament, that Jesus' blood sanctifies you. That means he puts you apart for a special purpose. Right? Uh, some people, that the word sanctify, the word holy, they think it, 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 it means, you know, untouchable. All that it means is that there is a specific purpose for that, that object. And you have been sanctified by the blood of Jesus. Right? And you were made a king and a priest by the blood of Jesus. So what that really says is this, that everything that you do, everything that you do is holy. And everything that you do, you represent God. Andrew Murray in his book, The Blood of the Cross, says it like this, in each relationship of his life, his home, his business, commercial or political affairs, he must give himself up to be led by the Holy Spirit to live according to God's laws for his glory. And then the blood in its reconciling, cleansing, sanctifying power will embrace everything. Here's what he just said, that because you're a priest to God, everything that you do is holy. Not just some things. You know, that was one of the big deals about the Reformation. Martin Luther said, the milkmaid that milks the cow and the pastor who preaches the sermon serve God equally. Serve God equally. Why? Because every one of us are anointed. Every one of us are called. You're to bring God's presence every place that you go. When you get there, the kingdom gets there. T.L. Osborne, many of you maybe not know who T.L. was. T.L. Osborne, uh, at the time that, well, he's been dead for quite a while now, but in the 20th century, when he was alive, he had spoken to more people face-to-face -face than anyone that ever lived, more than Billy Graham. Now, Billy Graham later surpassed him, but he spoke to more people face-to-face -face than anyone that had ever lived. Um, just doing huge evangelistic crusades, whether it was uh, in Asia, Africa, South America, every place that he went. And, and I thought that was interesting. This is what he said. He said, I've never was called of God. He said, the only call of God that I ever had, listen, was Mark 16 that said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And he said, this is what I believe. He said, when I, when I arrive in whatever country I arrive in, he said, the kingdom arrives with me. Okay, Why? Because he understood that he was sanctified, that by the blood of Jesus, he was made a priest. And he had a call on his life, every one of us do. We have an anointing on our life. And when we arrive, wherever, when you arrive at work, the kingdom will arrive at your work. Right? Whenever you arrive, wherever you're going, when you get there, the kingdom gets there. Colossians 1.20, and by him to reconcile, that means to make right, all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So he reconciled, he made right everything that was wrong between you and God by the blood of the cross. Everything that was wrong was paid for and made right. How many of you have ever had to reconcile a checkbook? I hate that. 
just hate it. I delegate it to Jeannie. <laughs> right? But you know, you got to make it all work out, and everything's got to be just right. Well, that's what Jesus did with his blood. Everything that was wrong in the relationship with you and God, he made right by the blood of his cross. Again, it's not by works. It's not by your effort or my effort. Uh, uh, Andrew Womack says this about religion. He said, false religion is man's concept, not God's ordained salvation. It teaches that right standing with God and blessing comes as a result of our own good works. It's always preaching. You must come to church. You must pay your tithe. You must do this. You must do that. And if you do all of these things, then God will accept you. That is anti-gospel. It is against the good news of God's grace because it's putting the burden of salvation on your back for you to bear, and nobody can save themselves. But by the blood of his cross, he reconciled you to God. Everything that was wrong, every problem that existed between you and God, past, present, and future, he took care of by the blood of his cross. And you are not made right with God by the blood plus something else. It's just by the blood of Jesus. The blood removed everything out of the way could, that could separate you from God. In fact, in Colossians 2 and verse 12, it says, Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, having taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So anybody that was there when Jesus was crucified, they'd have seen three crosses, Jesus in the middle, sheepskin or some sort of a parchment above Jesus' head that said, Jesus, the King of the Jews. Three languages. But if you could have seen into the Spirit, you know, you're looking right now at my nice shoes here. Pretty nice, huh? My new jeans. And... That's what you see. But how many know if we took an x-ray picture, it would be very different? And really, the Gospels give you a picture like you're looking at something. But in the epistles, it gives you an x-ray picture. Not from man's perspective, but you see God's perspective of what happened at the cross. And it says at the cross, from God's perspective, something else took place. In fact, if you could have seen in the spirit realm, you would have seen the hand of God, take and nail a list to that cross. There'd have been 613 things on that list because there were 613 commandments. Not 10, by the way. There's 613. If you want to be justified by the law, it's not 10. 613. Yeah. But every sin that any person could ever commit is on that list. And that list God nailed to the cross. The Pharisees, the Romans may have been killing him because he was the king of the Jews. But God said, no, he's on this cross. And he's here shedding his blood to take out of the way to pay for every one of these sins. For every man, every woman, every child that will ever live. And he took it all out of the way. So there was nothing between you and me and God. We have today, because of that, freedom to enter into God's presence. The Bible calls it the holiest of all. Hebrews 10, 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now that Old Testament priest could go in one time a year Sprinkle that blood seven times on that mercy seat and come out, and he could never go back again until the next year. But the Bible says today, in fact, they were so afraid. He had to do everything right, right? And tradition says that they put a rope around his ankle so that if he did anything wrong and died, they could pull him out because there were no volunteers to go get him. Exactly right. Once a year, never without blood. But what Jesus did with his blood, putting his blood on the mercy seat, 
is different. His blood, by the way, that mercy seat on top of the ark, angels with their wings above it, and God said, my presence, he said, I will meet with you above the mercy seat and under the angel's wings. That is God's presence right there. That's God's throne. <clears throat> and it's called the mercy seat. Let us then boldly and confidently draw near to the throne of grace. That's the mercy seat. The throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners. So l- listen, you don't get what you deserve. Are you not glad? I actually had this happen one time. I got pulled over by a cop for speeding. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. He said, how fast were you going? I said, well, pretty fast. (laughs) I said, "Uh, sir, I do not want justice. (laughs) I would like mercy. (laughs) Okay, listen. How many of you do not want justice? We want mercy. The throne of God's unmerited favor or mercy for us sinners. That we may receive mercy for our failures. And find grace to help in good time. For every need. Appropriate help. Well-timed help. Coming just when we need it. Now listen, it says great, excuse me, mercy for our failures. God's mercy is for your sins, your failures, <coughs> the areas where you've missed it. But notice, it's not just mercy. We can find grace. And grace is God's supernaturally enabling and helping you for today and tomorrow. So on that, mercy, on that mercy seat, there's stuff that covers your past, but it covers your today and your tomorrow as well. Mercy for your past, but we need grace. We need God's ability. We need his wisdom. We need his anointing for today. Now, notice that it says for every need, appropriate help, well-timed help, coming just when you need it. Now, it's for every need. So in other words, you have no special problems. Sometimes people think they got a special problem. Well, like, you're going to go to God and say, God, this is what's happening. And God's going to go, oh, my goodness, I've never seen anything like that before. What are we going to do? Holy Ghost, come here. Gabriel, help. Listen, you do not have a special need. There, there, you, you, you do not. It, it, every, everything, everything, everything is covered by the blood of Jesus. Right? There is no special need, whether it's spiritual, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whether it's relational, whether it has to do with your work, your school, your home, everything is covered by the blood of Jesus. And there is help for you at the mercy seat. And it's not once a year. You can come in boldly because the blood of Jesus is on that mercy seat The Bible says in Hebrews that that blood is speaking on your behalf right now. And 24-7 in God's presence is that blood. So you can come boldly. You can come boldly. Now, Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 12. It says that he himself, Jesus, gave some to be apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for or to do the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, now here's probably the greatest detriment to the church in 1,700 years. Watchman Nee, in in his book on the universal priesthood, brings this out. That for the first three centuries of the church, every believer was a minister. Every believer was a priest. But Constantine gets saved. Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire. And we got uh, like a, a hierarchy. Right? And, and there were like 
there were like special priests or pastors, and they were to do everything, right? And literally, the, the spirituality of the church and of the believers began to diminish, right? Because literally, look at this ver- these two verses. They say that my job is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. I mean, literally, there's people who literally, they, they just say this, well, pastor, you know, you talk a couple times a week, you know, we pay you good. I'm tithing. Why don't you just do everything? Because it's not my job. The Bible says my job is to equip you to do the work of the ministry to edify the body of Christ, Right? And the biggest problem the church has had is we thought, well, we just got a few people, and they're going to do everything. They're going to do the praying. They're going to do the ministering. They're going to do the comforting. They're going to do all of that. But that is so unscriptural. And it is the greatest detriment to the church that, the, that we do not understand that every single Christian is a priest, is a believer, is a minister, is anointed, and is called. Every single one. Right? Ephesians 2 and 10. For we are God's own handiwork, his masterwork of art, created in Christ Jesus, born again, spiritually transformed and renewed, to do the good works which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths he has set, or predestined, other translations say, so that we can do those good works that he prearranged and made ready for us to live. One translation says living the good life that he prearranged and made ready for us. So look, every every one of us, God has prepared good works for you, and he has paths prepared ahead of time for you. He's got things for you to do. You are not called to just do good stuff and make it to heaven. Do your best, make it to heaven. That is not true. Every believer is called to service. Every believer Right? And, and until we understand that, we are, we are going to be missing our calls. We're going to be taking the anointing that God has put upon us, and, and it's literally going to be doing so very, very little of what God has anointed us to do. Right? You know, the gospel says to be great, you serve. To find your life, you need to give your life. To be filled, you need to empty yourself. To have true riches, you need to be generous. To save your life, you need to give your life. You know, as, as priests of God, which every one of us are, because Jesus made you a priest by his blood, we need to passionately, with total devotion, serve our king. Serve our king. You know, it's the fuller life. There's more love. There's more joy, there's more peace, there's more righteousness. It becomes an extraordinary life when we do that. We tend to think, well, you know, to be great, I just need to have people serve me. But Jesus said it's just the opposite. He said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. He said, and if you want to be great, he didn't say it was bad to want to be great. In fact, he encouraged his disciples He says, if you want to be great, he says, you need to be the servant of all. We're anointed, every one of us. We're called as priests, and we're called to serve. We're called to serve first our God and then people to serve. And when we arrive somewhere, the kingdom arrives. Because the kingdom of God, it's not meat and drink. It's righteousness, peace, and joy. The Bible says in the Holy Ghost, and Jesus said, the kingdom of God, it is within you.